You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. We're jamming! Bum, dum, dum, bum, dum. I want to jam it with you! We're jamming! We're jamming! We're jamming! We're jamming! I hope you like jamming too! We're jamming! 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 I want to jam it with you! That was pretty good, actually. We're jamming! We're jamming! Two hours later. We're jamming! All right, everyone. We are jamming it with you today. Welcome. You're watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. So, Jimmy, <laughs> yes, whew, I'm already a little sweaty just from the practice of from, singing that song. And jamming. Jamming takes energy. Y'all don't know how long we sit here on our phones just trying to figure out what song it is. Today, and then, we like, looked up best song ever, <laughs> and then we found Bob Marley, and I think that's up that there. That tracks. That tracks. That tracks, literally. Uh, and this is going to be one of the best episodes ever. Really? Good segue, segue, man. Thank you. Uh, it's something we've <laughs> talked about a lot on the show in general, but we haven't gone sort of in-depth in, on this topic in a long time. Yeah, it's good to have refreshers as well because the game itself has evolved like we've talked about. And so revisiting these topics is as important because sometimes when I build decks, I forget some of the basics and then I build a bad deck and I go, why does that deck not work? And and the last time we really talked in-depth about Mana Curve, which is what, spoiler alert, this topic or this episode is about, uh, was five years ago. Wow. And so there's been a lot of new commander players, new people to our channel since that time who probably haven't even heard of that episode. Yep, yep, good um, point. Yeah, so we're going to be discussing Mana Curve curve, mastering your mana curve. I think understanding how you can improve your mana curve is one of the sort of most important pieces of making your decks more efficient, yep. more powerful, and more fun when you play them. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is sit down at the table and play a game and not be able to do your thing. And the mana curve has a huge part to do with that. Uh, if you're a limited player, you know all about it. So we're going to get right into it. But we have a couple of really interesting and important announcements to get to first. Uh, we have a, for the first time ever, yeah. A live show, well, for the second time ever. We did one on episode 100, <laughs> that's right. But yeah, we are doing Command Zone Live. This is a special event that Josh and I are hosting. It's going to be on a separate platform, but it's going to be the first time we're really ever getting to sit down and do a live show and interact directly with our audience. Yeah, in fact, we're teaming up with Wizards of the Coast to do a series of these live episodes. There's going to be, there's four planned right mm -hmm. now, one every single month. And the first episode is on March 29th. We're going to be talking about the worst mistakes that commander players make. You know, I'm really excited about this, me because we are usually recording this. It's just the two of us and a camera, and then it gets edited. Yeah. Uh, the live episodes are going to give us a chance to interact with the audience in real time. You're going to be in the chat. We're going to be able to have you join the discussion. Yeah, we always do to the listeners and ask the question about the episode that we're doing, and then later on, we don't really get to go back and hear from you know some of the amazing examples that you all bring up. So this is going to be a chance for you all to contribute to the conversation and hopefully evolve it as we go through and feel like you're a part of the show. So if you are interested in attending that episode, and in fact, it's like tomorrow or the next day when you're watching this, if you're watching when it comes out, uh, there's going to be a link in the show notes, and you just have to go and register, and it'll give you all the information of, of how to attend. Yep, and if you miss the first one, there's going to be three, mores, uh, three more after it. So all you have to do is just provide your information, and you'll get the access to Command Zone live, live, live. All right, and of course, we've got to talk about our sponsors, channelfirewall.com slash command. That is the place you want to go if you want to pick up some cards to make your mana curve better. <laughs> they have uh, an awesome awesome marketplace which a bun with a bunch of vendors mm -hmm. vying for your business. There's a ton of inventory. If you're looking for a card, they are going to have it and uh, they're going to have good prices. All of their vendors are local game stores yeah. and so, you know, you're going to get a good service experience as well. These are businesses. These aren't just amateur people selling you stuff so they're going to know how to package the cards, get them to you quickly. Channelfireball.com slash command. Again, that is our uh, affiliate link and you can even put in the code command at checkout if you forget to use the URL. Very convenient and you know, our next sponsor doesn't actually affect your mana curve but when you lay your deck out in front of you, you want to make sure that the cards look nice. And so you're going to put them into Ultra Pro sleeves on your Ultra Pro play mat with your Ultra Pro dice. Actually, one thing that I do when I'm making a deck is sometimes if I need to count how many lands I need or whatever, I'll use a dice like a D20 or an Ultra Pro dice and put it on a land or in terms of like how many five drops do I have? I can just put the dice on top and lay it out in front of me and it actually helps out so much to have clear dice, things that you can really read. They have their new uh, Eclipse dice that look amazing, but protecting your cards is just as important as making a deck function. Yeah, Ultra Pro really does make the best dice deck boxes sleeves mm -hmm. play mats they have it all um yeah and they're a big sponsor of the show so thanks to them uh and then before we get into the main topic there is something exciting going on that we just wanted to mention here 
if you watch Game Nights, I think last week at the point you're checking this out, uh, it was the fan episode Woo-hoo. of Game Nights. And the way that fans get to be on an episode of Game Nights is they audition to be on the show. And we are currently running those auditions for the next episode, fan episode of Game Nights. If you want to audition to be on the show, and and if you're chosen, what happens is we fly you out to Los Angeles, we put you up in a hotel, you hang out with us for a few days. We usually, party. Yeah, we usually throw like a, a fun Commander Night party that's off camera. Pizza. Just so we can get to know everybody. <laughs> yep, there's there's usually pizza. Our, last time I think we did a taco bar. Oh yeah, yeah, that uh, was amazing. We usually get dinner with you a few times. You really get to hang out and get to know these people before we shoot the episode, just so there's a good amount of camaraderie and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and we've made really good friends with all the fans that have come on. On. So if you would, you know, like to be on the show, show off your commander skills in front of the world, you will have that chance if you just audition. Now, there are some rules and restrictions. Again, the link is going to be in the show notes. Uh, you go down below this video, you expand that uh, link. Yeah. And then you'll find the link and it'll tell you how to enter. All the details. Yeah. And we'll talk more about it on the end step. Uh, but one of the main things that you need to be is be a patron of the show. Yep. So that's the final sponsor of our show is our patrons. We love our patrons at patreon.com slash command zone. We shout out one lucky patron at the beginning of each episode. And there's also tons of new updates. So make sure you check it out. Yep. And that this episode is dedicated to to Broderick Hansen. Broderick, you rock. Mm, bop. Broderick, oh, Hansen. <laughs> I was like, what? Not the first time I was thinking of Matthew it. Broderick. Probably the last time he wants to hear it, though. So. <laughs> okay, moving on. Let's talk about mastering your mana curve. Five years ago, May of 2017 was the last time we talked about it, and a lot of the fundamentals still apply today, even though Commander has evolved quite a bit since this time. So we've learned a lot as players as well as consumers of the format, and I'm sure you all out there as well. Yeah, that episode is uh, episode 156. It was called The Importance of Mana Curve. It was in May of 2017 at that time things like scryfall didn't really exist right edh rec i'm not sure if it existed uh, in the same form it might have been today, in yeah. infancy at that time yeah 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 you know so uh, obviously a lot has changed since then and which is the reason we thought this is worth revisiting um but it might be fun for some of the those of you out there you know they're interested to go back and look at that whole episode after listening to this and just seeing you know what's changed yeah um i'm gonna i plan to do that well hopefully a lot of the things stay the same so that anyone get, that happens to chance upon the old they were episode like, wow you were smart back then too yeah maybe we'll change the show notes to be like please see the new episode first <laughs> all right let's start with the big question just so everybody's on the same page here jimmy what is mana curve all right so mana curve is it's technically not a curve so when you look at your deck you're going to see the casting cost the cmc as it used to be called the mana value at the top right of each card and the way it's distributed across your deck is a mana curve so your one drops two drops three drops all the way up to nine drops and your curve is basically how many of each of those cards are in your deck you'll see it as sort of like a bell curve usually uh, it's a little blockier if you're doing it like in bars and lines so that's why we call it a curve though because it looks nicer yeah if you were plot to plot it on a graph right you'd have a certain amount of ones twos threes spells that cost that amount of mana Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah usually they create some sort of curve where they peak at some point and then they start to go down they're very rarely sort of jaggedy so that's why we call it a curve yeah Uh, i I, just to clarify um just so nobody misses it the the when we say the cost of a spell we're going to talk about the top right corner is the amount of colored mana symbols and the amount of generic mana symbols Add it up. So a two drop, one in a red, that's a two drop. Yep. Yep. If it costs a green and a blue, that's also a two drop. Yeah. Before it used to be called converted mana cost because you'd be converting the one and the red into just one and one equals two. Now we call it mana value. So basically add up how much how many lands you will need to tap if you've only got lands out to cast the spell. That is the mana value. It's converted mana cost. Spe- I'll probably cost say, of the spell. Huh. Yeah, I'll probably say CMC just because we're used to it. So yeah. those those terms are interchangeable. Um all right. So when we're talking about mana curve and why it's important, it's it's about making deck building choices that are not only just sort of based on what cards do, mm-hmm. you know, what what their outcome is or how big they are, but also taking into consideration the mana cost of those spells because you know you don't want to have all your spells cost like six plus mana, right? You just won't do anything in the early turns. Yeah, I think most players understand that kind of intrinsically but really like drilling down and paying attention to your curve is a thing a lot of deck builders don't do 
Yeah, and it makes deck building actually, it's one of the most difficult parts of deck building is cutting cards. And typically the first, one of the first considerations that you make when you're understanding which cards to get rid of is your mana curve. Uh, because, you know, in a vacuum, when you're looking at just pure power level, your deck would be all eight drops because those are the most powerful cards in your deck. But you need to have a balance. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to play the game. And the reason that the curve is also a nice way to visualize it is because when you have a good curve, it's like being on a good wave or a good road and you're skateboarding mm. down it. You can flow into it. You're actually gaining momentum and pushing into using your deck in the right way instead of sort of getting caught. Let's say you're trying to uh, push a car. It's way easier if you have friends help you push the car at first and then it gets going and then you can move. If you're trying to push the car just by yourself on turn one, it's not going to happen. Yeah, another way I like to think about curves is if you just look at your opening hand and it just has like, you know, three lands and four spells, mm -hmm. but three of those spells cost four or more mana you don't even know that you'll ever be able to cast those spells in the, that game. Because, or maybe just one of them, who knows, yeah. yeah. But you don't know that you're going to get your fourth land or anything like that. And so it's... And if you have really big spells, like stuff that costs eight, nine mana plus, that's kind of like you mulligans. Like, it's not going to help you for so long in the game that it doesn't matter for, like, the first, you know, four or five turns. Yeah, the card may as well not exist because you're not going to do anything with it. And we're not saying don't put seven, eight, nine drops in your deck at all, but you have to be real careful about those. Whereas one and two drops... Uh, spells in your deck, you, you can be reasonably certain that you will be able to play them in a game. So when you see those in your opening hand, you're like, regardless of what they do, and obviously we want to put good cards in our deck, Yeah, I, I will be able to play them and I will do things. Yeah, doing things turns out very important in Magic. Uh, we've all been there. We've had hands that we shouldn't have kept or hands or decks that were built with way too many high cost things and not being able to do things is a huge reason why Commander is not fun. So outside of just, oh, you're playing technically correct, this is actually the venue for you, in the, va the not the venue, the way for you to get the most fun out of your deck is by making sure your mana curve is proper. Yeah, I would say that how much I did in the game is more indicative of how much fun I had yeah. than whether I won the game. For me personally, and I think a lot of people are like that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've lost so many games now in the games where I've lost, but I was able to do something cool and affect things and do and combo off or whatever it was are way more fun than, oh yeah, I you know we dragged it out for three hours and I punched one person with the one one to win. <laughs> it kind of feels like, and I know I always make basketball analogies, but if you're on the team with somebody who's like a ball hog and you just never touch the ball, ah, yeah. you can run up and down the court a lot, but you just don't feel like you really got to play the game at all. Whereas you maybe you win those games because the ball hog's really good, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that would I would still prefer people who pass me the ball, even if I miss the shots. And but I get to do some stuff, and but I lose the games, right? Like, yeah, because I'm not gonna like I, I always say I'm not gonna become an NBA player. So you know that that well, dream has left the building. Has know, it? Has it? <laughs> What's the mana curve on becoming an NBA player? Actually, the mana curve is about six feet or higher. If we had to <laughs> yeah, go with unfortunately, yeah. genetics didn't help me out on yeah. that one. Um, you'd you be like six ten, maybe <laughs> seven six foot. Ten. Oh my chance. gosh! Yeah, uh, you can also go online deck building sites. Da tapped out mocks field after you put in your deck will usually show you your curve uh, oh, sort yeah. of plotted out and that's another great way to just get a good idea of what your deck looks like um otherwise you always see players doing this when they build a deck they'll they'll build it from left to right with their one drops on the left side and their highest drops on the right and they'll sort it maybe by creatures and non-creature spells yeah you just kind of create rows of all your cards and there's usually about 10 rows and you know all the lands go out mm -hmm. on the far left then it's one drops then it's two drops yeah, blah, da, da, blah, blah. Da, da, da. okay so why is mana curve important? We've already tried, kind of touched on this a little bit, but paying attention to the mana curve helps your deck sort of run faster and more efficiently. There's an old adage in Magic that whoever, the player that spends the most amount of mana in a game is, you know, more than likely going to win. Yeah. So, and this is, this adage is from uh, 1v1. Mm -hmm. And so because of commander and multiplayer, it doesn't hold up 100%, but I think it's still an important uh an important thing to to realize because let's imagine we're in a game, Jimmy and I'm playing against you and I don't do anything on turn one and you play a one drop. And then I go to my two and I play a two drop and then you play a two drop. And then my turn three, I don't have it to play. So I pass with, so, so I have my two drop still. You have a one drop and mm -hmm. a two drop and you play a three drop. And then on turn four, I play a four drop and you play a four drop. You've, you've got a one drop and a three drop that I don't have. Yeah. I've matched you on the other two and you've used all your mana. So you just have four more mana in play than I've got. Yeah, in play is a great way of putting it because we don't see mana as that. When you tap your lands, it's like, okay, cool, I've done it. But you don't think about like, oh, that card on the battlefield is an investment. I spent uh, mana to get that card out there and now it's doing something based sort of on the mana value and what the card does itself. And if you think about it, it almost doesn't matter really what those specific cards are. Mm -hmm. You're going to be ahead in that game because unless, you know, 
we're in some weird situation, maybe it's limited or something, where like I, one of mine was a rare and yours were all commons. For the most part, you know, most one drops are similar power level. Most two drops are yeah. similar power level. That's that's just how magic is designed, right? Um, and obviously there is some variety and some variance in there. There are certain cards that are sort of undercosted or whatever. But yeah. in general, the player that spends the most mana wins because if you just spent... 30 mana in a game and I only spent 20, the extra 10 mana worth of stuff, regardless of what it is, is just enough for you to overcome whatever I did. Yeah, if you look at it as just, okay, you can only spend mana to put out creatures and each creature is power and toughness is equal to its mana value. So again, I played the 1-1, one, one, two, 2 and a 3-3 three, three, and you only played the 2-2. Two, two. I have a 3-3, three, three, a 2-2 two, two, and a 1-1, one, one, you have a 2-2. Two, two. Who is winning that game right now? Yeah. The person with the more creatures because I can swing both the 3-3 three, three and the 2-2 two, two into you and come out on top. And if Josh misses another thing, well, then all of a sudden my my advantage is actually not just better, but it's actually growing. And that's how a lot of commander games go is that once you can accumulate an advantage, and that's why value interest is so good, you can actually use that to your advantage to make a bigger gap between you and the next player. So there's a nice tug and pull between low costed cards and high costed cards, because in general, the high costed cards are more powerful, but the low costed cards are sort of more flexible as far as allowing you to spend all of your mana. Mm -hmm. So if you have a three drop and a two drop in hand, and I've got a two drop and a four drop in hand, on turn three, you're going to be ahead. On turn four, though, I'm going to play my four drop and maybe jump ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So think about it in this terms, though. What if it was turn five? Now, all of a sudden, I can't play my four and my two on my turn five. Uh -huh. I can only play one of them. But you can play your three and your two. So the fact that your stuff was a little bit lower CMC maybe gave you an advantage there, allowing you to fill in the gaps. And and this is something I think uh, a lot of players learn early when, again, when they're playing 1v1. I think in Commander, maybe they don't because mm -hmm. you don't think about things in this way. But one of the uh, really big level up moments for a lot of Magic players is this idea of Make your decision based on what allows you to spend the most mana each turn to be as mana efficient as possible. Right. Because like, let's say you have an allowance and the allowance is in this weird way where after your parent gives you the allowance, like, all right, 10 bucks for one week, but anything you don't spend after that week, you give back to me. You should spend it all, right? Yeah. Or try to spend it mo the most efficient way or based on sort of what you have available to you. Like, I need to get three candy bars at, instead of one thing for $10 because those three candy bars to me are more worth it than the one thing that costs $10. Yeah, and I think a lot of newer players, you'll see them make plays where it's like they have four mana, but they play a three drop. And they have something for four mana in their hand, but they're worried about it dying or they want to mm. set something else up. And then, you know, it's turn six and they only they play a five drop or five mana worth of stuff. And these little wasted manas along the way can really cost you because you can be in a situation where, well, okay, it's turn seven or eight. Yeah. And I've done that three or four times. And now Jimmy, who's used all his mana on every single turn, is just five or six mana ahead of me. That's... That's a maybe like a mind's dilation or a smothering tithe as an extra card he has on the battlefield that I don't have. And it's not because he drew more cards than me or anything. It's because he spent his mana more efficiently. So that, yeah. that advantage is created by just being mana efficient. Yeah, there are a lot of scenarios that even you can set up with your deck where you can draw the same opening hand and play out the same first five turns and do it in a variety of different ways. And so a lot of the decisions that you make can be helped by having a better mana curve. Because I think one of the my level up moments is realizing I was always getting stuck with way too many four drops in my hand. Mm. Four is just this naturally crowded spot in Commander. And as a result, if you have two four drops, that's eight mana. That is such a hard hard amount of mana to pull off in the first few turns that you're almost always you're never gonna be able to pay. even like a four drop and a three drop that's seven mana yep so it's really hard to pair it together with other things and so mana curve really does make you look at this and go how do i maximize my efficiency and as a result have the most amount of fun this isn't just about pure min maxing and playing the hardest and best magic it's about giving you the most chances to do the most stuff and as a result have and again you're against three other players so the disadvantage in in right it's not just like oh josh is ahead by one mana it's like if everyone else had an efficient turn and i lacked one now you're technically behind by three player amount of mana yep yep and i would say that actually like lowering your mana curve a lot of the low cmc low mana value stuff does tend to be expensive because it's good in legacy and things like that but there are usually like low cmc options that are a little bit worse out there that people mm -hmm. don't play if you're a budget player i would say lowering your mana curve is almost better than trying to compete on a different access with everybody. You're not uh, going to have right. m maybe more powerful cards than the non-budget players, but what you could maybe do is play more cards, be more mana efficient. That is yeah. a way to maybe gain an advantage. Um, so I think it, it works no matter what you're doing. Obviously, 
things like CEDH, competitive players, are super efficient. They play a lot of like zero costed things. Yeah. They, you know, I have a CEDH deck and I don't think there's more than a couple of cards in the whole deck that are more than five CMC, right? It's like three cards or something. And usually the curves are super low because the games are going to end so early that it doesn't make sense to have a lot of really huge drops that are, again, going to rot in your hand. And yeah. being down just like one card in your opening hand can be the difference between winning and losing when somebody's going to combo off. So this is something I think CEDH players sort of intrinsically know. But I don't want people to think we're telling you to play CDH. This is also something that works at casual tables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to play like moxes and stuff like that to lower your curve. You can just just be more cognizant about, you know, looking at your curve and being like, okay, I just need to take out some four, five, and six drops and put in a couple one, two, and three drops. Yeah. And you know, it became better. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to put in mana vaults, <laughs> you know, but but just find some things in those slots on the curve uh, that will fit into your strategy. Even if they're not quite as good as your four, five, and six drops, it'll probably make your deck a little bit stronger and a little bit more fun again, because you will have less of those games where you just can't play those cards. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, like if CEDH is like an F1 racer, highly tuned, and there's not a single bolt out of place, you know, and maybe very very casual is a go-kart you still don't want a go-kart that doesn't start right. you don't want a go-kart that putters out after it goes two feet you know and if you're middle ranged maybe it's like a corvette or a lamborghini right. in the high range but you still don't want one of those cars that just dies. tires just blows out yeah or, or something, something like that yeah so it's still we're all driving vehicles here our decks whatever it is not sure guy um and so making it just function and get across the finish line is more important than how fast you necessarily do it yeah. All right. Let's talk about something that's really important to determining like how you lay out your curve of your deck or how you think about it. And that is the mana value of your commander. The lead singer. Yeah. So the first and usually most important question is what is the mana value of my commander? Because this is a card that you know you always will have access to. Um, and it's that's what makes commander different than other formats. Mm -hmm. If you're building a deck for legacy or something, you kind of have to put a nice curve and rely on redundancy at those places on the curve and mathematics basically to say like i will probably have something at one two three whatever right whereas we can say well at this one spot on the curve i know i always have that because that is my commander yeah it's as though it is in your hand since the first turn it's just that everyone can see it so you'll always know if your commander is four mana value that you will have a four drop and I think it's really important to consider the mana value of a commander when choosing the cards for your deck because a lot of times you're looking at cards and you're saying like, oh, wow, these cards are all really good. But if they sit at the same mana value as your commander, ah. you probably don't want that row of cards to be that long because you know what you're doing when you have three mana most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're a lot of times you're like, well, I'd rather have a card that I can play before my commander or one that can play after. And the one after can cost a little bit more because presumably I built my deck to hit my land drops. So I'm going to have more mana the turn after I play my commander. Yeah, bloating that spot is a very easy thing to do because it, it may just be that your four CMC commander, four mana value commander has a bunch of other four mana value spells that just rock. But you're going to get into the situation where you go on your fourth turn, you go, wait, do I want to play that card or do I want to play my commander? And sometimes it's, you know, it, once it gets too full up, that decision ends up hurting you quite a bit. Yeah, I would say that's one of my biggest level up moments was when I learned like, oh, if my commander's four CMC, then I'm going to cut a bunch of four drops. I'm going to play more threes and more fives. Yeah. And yeah. even like more threes and ones or more twos yeah. and twos, because that also gives you the option, you know, because you're still going to get to that four man spot no matter what. And there are times that you don't want to play your commander. I'd rather play two two drops than one four drop. I think this is another Sometimes. reason why partners are really, really good. Oh, yeah. Because think about that. They fill two slots on the curve. Like, it, uh, of course, you can play two partners that are the same. The same, yeah. <laughs> but that's pretty rare um it's 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 just so powerful and a lot of good decks have like a low uh, mana value commander and a really high like a six or seven yeah right because they fill out two important spots on the curve it's like i always know i have an early play and then i always know i have kind of a finisher play yep and then you can really short your deck in those two areas a little bit because you know you've got that covered and those decks maybe can play a little more threes and fours and plan specifically around it like rograx a great example oh, yeah. he's this zero drop commander so the idea behind that's like oh now all of a sudden i don't feel so bad about playing a three mana value equipment because i know i'll always have the thing to equip onto it and you can like really change your play patterns based on what you're doing there i think that the mana value of a commander also it really kind of determines the the type of ramp you want or mm -hmm. i guess the the cmc that you want your ramp to sit at yeah so this if, is really important yeah so if your uh commander is two cmc then this is the place where even in casual i might consider playing some zero cmc ramp uh just to get my commander online going Turn one. Turn one, right? Because what you're trying to do is accelerate how fast your commander comes out. 
and knowing and thinking about CMC will really help you determine which ramp will get you there. Mm -hmm. So Chrome Mox, Mox Diamond, these are expensive cards. Uh, and casual, they can actually be bad because they're card disadvantage. You have to exile or discard the card to play it to tap for that man. Yeah, Lotus yeah. Petal, Simeon Spirit Guide, that kind of stuff that's, uh, again, we think of as CADH a lot of times not seen as much in casual. But I've added mm -hmm. two, let's say I was playing Light Paws or something like that. Right. Obviously, some of those cards can't go in that deck. But I would think maybe about playing those uh, cards just to get Light Paws going one turn early. And yeah, I get a little card di disadvantage, but it might be worth it to just get my game plan online faster yeah and light pause also kind of gives you card advantage so that's something to consider as well and it's mono white so i don't think you can really push that to cedh anyway right <laughs> yeah, so you're not you in go. danger of being way too powerful yeah for we, your play group yeah there aren't as many two cmc mana valley commanders out at now anymore we, we typically see now they're going into the three four five range so you're not going to come this issue won't come up that often but just know if you want to play your commander on turn one you're going to make considerations and that's also going to affect your mana curve now, if you're three CMC of a commander, you're probably not gunning to put it out turn uh, turn one, although mm -hmm. you could obviously with the stuff we already talked about. But in general, turn two is what you're hoping for. Yep. But that's still not easy because one mana ramp is not super prevalent. Uh, but, but you know, there's stuff like Lanoir Elves. All the elves, pretty yeah, much. Deathrite Shaman, Utopia Sprawl. Mm -hmm. If I was really, really had my heart set on getting my commander out uh, turn three, I might play a bunch of those cards. Obviously, you have to be in green for most of them. Yeah, my Tatsunari deck is a three CMC commander. I didn't play Lanoir Elves. I played Utopia Sprawl because yeah. it matched with the deck. So that was like, I need to put as many one... Uh, uh, one mana ramp cells as possible so that I can get my commander out. It, it might be a thing. I mean, I don't think somebody would be crazy in a Tatsunari deck to play Lanwar Elves, Birds of Paradise, mm -hmm. maybe a couple more elves just to say, you know, I want six or seven, maybe eight different ways in my deck to get ramp on turn one. Yeah. Just so I can get Tatsunari on turn two. So then on turn three, when I play an enchantment, I'm already going. Yeah. I don't yep. think that would be crazy. Um, I, it, it might be right, even though the elves and stuff are not, you know, synergizing with what the rest of your deck. Well, I mean, especially if you go going that mutate route that we oh, talked about, yeah, too. Yeah. That That'd Birds cool. of Paradise is looking real nice then. <laughs> uh, at the four mana value level, you are going to be looking for probably the most common ramp in the game, which is a lot of the one ramp we talked about, but also two CMC ramps. So all the Signets, the Talismans, Arcane Signet, Rampant Growth, Revisits. Uh, and so basically you're spending two CMC or two mana value on turn two to get up to four mana value on turn three. So again, all of these are sort of based on playing your commander one turn before you technically could with just lands. And we're assuming that you hit your land drop on every turn, yeah. right? You can only play the three CMC commander on turn two with one mana ramp and hitting both your land drops. But obviously you're not keeping a, a, a one lander and commander yeah. probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, four CMC is... Great because there are so many two mana rocks. We keep talking about this, but there's just more and more of them. And it seems like they're kind of ubiquitous now. So it's not hard to just really have enough ramp in your deck and it's all just two mana rocks. Yeah, like my Toric. There's so many two mana rocks that exist now. Yeah, you can easily get to just 12 or 13 just with the two mana rocks. Mm -hmm. And most colors have like another way or two. Plus you're going to have your soul ring probably yeah. um, to, to ramp in there that's even maybe a little better than the two mana rocks. So yeah, four CMC. You know, I had a question here, Jimmy. Yeah. What do you consider Wayfarer's Bobble Ooh, as good far question. as a ramp? Do you can, what CMC do you consider? Because it's one to play, but two, two to, to activate. Yeah. So it's technically three total mana. It also requires you, if you want to use it as a two cmc rock you have to play it on turn one right uh which also means that you can't have a tap land coming on turn one that's a really so good there point there are a lot of restrictions i because i've run into this where i sit there and I go well temple of silence wayfarer's bobble i guess i just scry later and hope i draw more lands because i want to get this out in turn one and ramp you want to give yourself the chance at least to ramp yeah on turn exactly two, right? yeah yeah so wayfarer's bobble is definitely a it's an interesting card because it, it's a budget way for a lot of people to put in green-esque mana ramp in a non-green deck i would actually consider this like two and a half yeah I, I think i consider it two in my mind but a lot of people would put it in the one mana mana curve slot Right. That's where like Tapped Out or Moxfield would put it, right? Yeah, that, it, technically it is where it sits, but it's not where it's used. Yeah, so you, I think you would need to consider things like this when you're thinking of your mana curve too, whereas Wayfarer's Bobble will not help you play your three CMC commander a turn early. Right. It's really kind of two mana ramp, and that's a that's still, like you said, it, it's probably a little worse than that, because what if you draw it on turn two? Yeah, that's really the, bad. Yeah, so 
it, it just things to consider about man rep. It's it's actually not as quite as cut and dry as just looking at the CMC in the top right corner. You do have to yeah. kind of consider the cost of activation and things like that. Yeah, not just that, but a lot of the signets require a man to put into and only make a certain kind of colored mana. And so that's why arcane signet's so good is because you can play it and then that same turn tap it to play another spell. Play whereas, one drop, play your death right shaman. Yeah. yeah. But if it is a you know a signet, you could tap two mana to play the signet and not actually be able to use the signet that turn. So not all two mana ramp is created equal. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, if you have a five mana value commander, now you're really sort of starting to open up. And these are the situations where I might start to think about playing some three CMC ramp. Mm -hmm. Now, if you consider that a five uh, mana value commander will come out on turn four, if you play three CMC ramp, it'll also come out on turn four if you play two, right. if you play a two mana rock, right? Yeah. So you, you still probably want to play the two mana rocks because it'll still make the other four drops and things in your deck come out earlier, yeah. but it'll also make your commander come out earlier. But still, I would consider like Warren Powerstone, ah, both of yeah. the Kodama's Reach, we see a lot of these get played, and I think, Jimmy, we've been talking about how we're playing them a little bit less these days. <laughs> yep. And and it, we've heard from people out there who a lot of people are not even playing Cultivates and Kodama's Reach that much anymore when five years Years ago, it was one of the most played cards in the format, or one of, there's two of them, you know what I meant. Yep. Um, Coalition Relic, Chromatic Lantern, these are cards that I start to consider when my commander is 5 CMC, but I usually don't think about them before that. Yeah, you wrote down here that you you try and put a lot of two drops in your deck in that case. What did you mean specifically by that? Yeah, so I'm thinking about that turn three. Yeah where hopefully I've played a 2CMC thing. Ah, because as a result, in turn three, you have access to four mana. Right, so what I would want to do is play a three mana rock mm -hmm. and then tap that rock with my extra land and play something that's 2CMC ah. so that I can use my three mana, you know, Chromatic Lantern or Coalition coalition Relic. I guess Relic, you can save it up so it's not as bad. Right. But, you know, if I played a Dark Steel Ingot or what's the Skyclave Relic, the one that... Skyclave Relic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I played one of those, then yeah, I want to use it the turn it comes into play if I can mm -hmm. so that I get that mana right out of it and then it kind of like it costs two, and then I get the advantage of having it the next turn also. Yeah, yeah. This kind of feels like you're playing Tetris almost. You're lining up the pieces oh. so that when you get it, it's like, cool, I can do this and clear these blocks, and with that last piece, clear that last block. Yeah, thinking about, like, El, a mana rock, like you said, whether you can use it or not the turn you play it, Signets versus other things, uh, and then building your deck to be like, okay, well, if I'm going to be in this situation pretty often where I'm going to have that, then I do want to use the mana so I'm not wasting it. So mm -hmm. I need to build my deck with even more lower of a curve so that I can use that mana right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. 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 And then we start getting up into the really high CMC commanders like seven, Six, plus. seven eight, nine, yeah. ten. And that's, I think, where we might start to think about running some higher, some four mana ramp. Because back in the day, I think we ran a lot more four mana ramp than we are now. Oh, yeah. I played Sky Shroud Claim in tons of my decks because it could get forests and all that stuff. Thran Dynamo is one of my most played ramp spells as well. Oh, man. When we first started this show back in 2014, I think Thran Dynamo was on, and Gilded Lotus were probably like in most Every decks. Every deck. Yeah. And they how many yeah. decks do you have anymore that have them? Two, three. And yeah. most of them have just very high CMC uh, cards or they have the ability to untap those artifacts and reuse them. That Yeah. But they're not in most of your decks like they used to be. Yeah. But I think if I had a seven CMC um, commander, then Sky Shard claims looking pretty good mm -hmm. because now on turn four or maybe even turn three, I play that and the next turn I should. So now I'm getting my commander out two you know, turns, turns earlier. earlier. Yeah. Maybe I'm getting out on turn four or five when it's a seven plus CMC commander, which is pretty good. Yep. Sky yep, Shard yep. claim obviously, you know, better than explosive vegetation because the lands can come into play untapped. And again, yeah. I might want more two drops because of that. Because that's a pretty good turn. Turn four, Sky Shard claim, get two lands, tap both of those, play something else. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things I remember watching uh, Cassius' is turn three Ugin. That's yeah. a great example of getting something, being able to play, and then instantly using it to make another thing on the battlefield. So using the lands from Sky Shroud claim, using the mana from Thrand Animal to play out your three CMC rock or whatever it is. That's sort of how you, it's almost like you're unfolding something and you're rolling it out. And with each fold, it perfectly folds into the amount of space that it has left to fold into. I put Basalt Monolith as another thing if my seven CMC commander was, oh, yeah. was something. And I, I was thinking about this. I don't, I'm going to say it, which is always a little bit iffy when I'm not <laughs> certain. But it feels like if you are a more budget player, yeah, then you might be better served actually to play some of these high CMC commanders because the best way to play them is to use these ramp spells that are not used as much and are therefore a little bit cheaper these days. Yeah, not as ubiquitous. Yeah, and so you're not fighting to buy the ramp spells that are expensive because everybody wants them. They're down at two and three CMC. Right. You don't mind as much playing a little bit 
bigger CMC ramp. Slightly dirtier and all that, yeah. Yeah, and you, and you maybe you use your early turns. You know, you ha- you're obviously going to have some two-mana rocks and stuff, but to play out some other pieces, creatures and things like that. And then you're like, boom, on four, Thrown Dynamo, not as spendy anymore. Yeah. Now I can play my high CMC commander, and I think that might end up being a little more budget-friendly. I'm just going to say that without doing any research about it. But I mean, it, it makes total sense. Usually the lower you go on your on the mana values, the more expensive the cards become because they start to get played in Legacy and other Eternal formats. Yeah, mom. Um, But there are so many cards now that also reward you for having a high mana value commander, so it's definitely something that I think Wizards is pushing to. Like, Stinging Steady is a great example. It changes based on the mana value you own on the battlefield or in the command zone. So I think we might be going in that world to reward people for having slightly higher uh, CMC commanders. I, I, as an aside, I do like that as a design space for Wizards to mm-hmm. try to push commander, oh, which please. is like incentivize higher CMC stuff. Yeah, uh, splashier. Make it just strategically advantageous if you build your deck in a certain way. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, so commander mana value is not the only thing to think about in terms of your commander. It's also important to think about play pattern. So what does your commander do? What are its abilities? How do you like to play it? Because we don't always just play our commander out there at the first possible instant, right? Yeah, sometimes it's strategically very bad to do so, especially for the Lightning Bolt commanders, ones that they you want to get rid of instantly. Back in the day, it was Kali of the Vast. It's just a 2-2. So many different things can get rid of it, and the moment it comes out without haste or protection, everyone's like, kill it. So it yeah. doesn't even matter if you ramped out on turn two to get it out there just in time. You're still going to feel bad. <laughs> yeah, so you would end up playing Kalia, like differently, right? Like, wait until you have some protection up. Yep. And then, so now I would, I would factor that into my mana curve. I'm not usually playing Kalia the second that I can. I usually have a little bit extra mana because I want to protect it, so now that's going to change my curve a little bit because my play pattern is different. I was thinking of my Shorakai deck oh, that yeah. I played recently on the Neon Dynasty uh, episode, and you probably want to play Shurikai and activate it the same turn you play it, right? Yeah, it's an artifact. It's not a creature yet. There's no reason not to be able to do that because you get so much advantage from it. And you don't feel bad, as bad anyway, if you play it and they go remove it and you're like, fine, I'll use draw the card once. off of it. I use it, you know, it's and and it, actually that kind of setup will often make people like not want to remove it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, he's gonna get the value anyway. No thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna one for zero myself or whatever. Like I'm yeah. gonna use a card. He's gonna gain a card, and it's his commander. So I'm kind of down two cards here. Mm-hmm. It feels bad. People might not do it. So I might build my deck, and I you know maybe worn Power Stone or Coalition Relic, and I don't think I put them in my deck. But thinking about now, those are probably more likely something that I would want, just because on turn four when I play it, I want to have five mana or turn, you yeah. know, whatever. I want to have that one extra mana. So I might think of it more like a five drop than a four drop. Yeah, that's why your mana vault was so good in that scenario yeah. because of the ability to give you just that extra amount to use your commander that same turn. And sometimes you'll be looking at some cards and being like, well, I don't know if I want this one or the other. Think about how you're using it in the game and that may actually sway you one way or the other. Have you played against a Satoru deck yet? I have, and I remove it on site every single time. Uh, and the you player, have to. Yeah, the player looking at me goes, oh, maybe I shouldn't play it like that. And I'm like, <laughs> you maybe shouldn't play it like that. Yeah, because it's too scary. You could get a Blight, Blight steel. steel. You could get a Jingataxis. You could get a, you know, a million different things. A Void Wind. Mama Memra Cool. There's so many different things that could come out and hurt you, yeah. Yeah, and you know those are all in the deck. So, like, it doesn't matter. If they swing, you just can't let them swing. Yeah. So Satoru is like a remove on site immediately if you can do it you do it yeah he's more like an enchantment creature yeah uh, even though he's not enchantment type but when he's played out he acts as an enchantment because he gives a passive ability to other cards in your hand and all that stuff so when i was if i was building my curve and i was building a satoru deck i wouldn't think about him as a three cmc commander because i wouldn't want to just play him out naked in the cold like hey i got no mana available go i mean maybe you got fierce guardianship or something but still or a swan song, but at that case, then, then he's I a need the four one. CMC yeah. commander. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to want to have protection for that commander. So I might think of it more along the, t- the lines of a four or a five. Yeah. And then you're getting close to seven, and seven is the point where you can play it, attack with something else, Ninjutsu immediately activate something in. it. And yeah. maybe Satoru does end up being closer to a seven CMC commander than a three, right? Just by the play patterns. Maybe you're like, play an unblockable thing, play a ramp spell, play another ramp spell, destroy something, play Satoru, attack my unblockable thing. Like yep. steel dead. Yeah, you know? it, it makes sense too because you do want the option to play those cards just out of your hand, the high CMC ones as well. So Satoru, I do think, is deceptive. It says, play it on three, use me on, on four. But because of the fact that it's so often removed, it may be play me on three when you have one blue up for Swan Song and then use me on four or play me on five when you have three and when you have seven total man available. Yeah, so you got two up for a negate or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, have you played against a Hanada deck yet? I have not. There's been a lot of discussion Boy. about Hanada decks, though. <laughs> yeah, Hanada's another one where I think I would want to play it and have 
two mana up to do one of these like crazy uh, reality spasm Heliod's intervention. Oh, oh my, my lord! Somebody gosh. did this to me. Where they well to us the That's table brutal. It was like Hanada. Helia's intervention destroy everything. everything. It's just like, what? oh For man, two, man. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. It, it just felt broken, and that made me think like, yeah, it was smart. They didn't play Anata at four, right? They mm-hmm. just waited until they were going to be able to do that because at that point they're like, whatever. If you kill Anata, doesn't matter. You guys are already screwed. Yeah, I got the thing. It did the thing once, and oftentimes with Commander these days, it just needs to do the thing once to have that massive effect. So I would think really hard about my curve and also what kind of ramp I want because Chromatic Lantern, a card I do not generally like, I think is correct in Hanada because most of those spells that are like color, right. color, and X, you need two colored. And Hanada costs three colored. And it's not in green, so you can't fix your mana with land yep. ram. So if on my sixth turn, I'm going to have to be like two specific colors left over after I cast my commander. Right. Then, yeah. Skyclave Relic obviously still looks kind of good. Maybe Dark Steel Ingot, those kind of things. I might even think about playing um, Dark Steel Ingot, maybe not, just because it doesn't scale very well until yeah. late game, which we'll talk about later. That's nice too because Hanada is a four CMC commander, but now that four CMC slot is a little less crowded. So your smothering tithe or whatever it is feels a little safer. It doesn't need to get rid of it instantly because you know that you're you're not casting Hanada on four. Plus, sometimes you run out of cards in your hand. You want to refill before you actually cast because maybe you'll get multiple shots at doing the Hanada thing. I mean, Smothering Tide might be the best card in that deck for that reason because you play it on four and then your next turn you're going to have the mana to yep. go Hanada. Uh, uh, unless Invention. everyone pays. <laughs> Which I've never seen happen ever. Yeah. Um, and then I think you also want to think about, and this is another play pattern consideration thing, but it's all it's related to ramp because does your commander ramp you yeah it's important to factor that in so the new stranger things cards dustin gadget genius taps for two colorless but you can only use it for artifacts, artifacts stuff. yep yeah so if i had dustin as one of my commanders then i think i would change my curve quite a bit as far as artifacts at least where because i it doesn't cost four mm-hmm and then I'm immediately going to have at least six, probably seven mana available to cast artifacts my next turn. Yeah. So I might, you know, have more sixes and sevens than I would normally have and less fours and fives. Right. Because I'm going to just jump over that part of the curve. I know because my commander gives me access to that. And Dustin's not like Satoru. I, I think most of the time he's going to live, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dustin will definitely live. He's way less scary. You might also consider if you're going to put in a lot of haste type grinding spells anger and all that stuff then you can fill up the two drop slot with more artifacts specifically and so you can kind of do a balance where like i do want two drop ramp in here but it's not to cast dust in on four necessarily because sometimes you know i want to give them haste and then use whatever it is yeah, but yeah. there are lots of different sort of like ways to look at the ways the cards interact with each other at that point kaidel is another uh part oh of kaidel is great I, w- yeah. I would never cast kaidel unless i knew i could he- she could tap for a ton she's scarier so because if you wheel she starts going nuts and maybe yeah. can go infinite so people might remove her. Although in my experience, people don't like. Yeah, it's a four drop. It's it and only taps for one unless you do like wheel or something. But even yeah. then, even Kaidel, it's like you play her on four, on five your next turn, and that's if you didn't ramp. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have possibly six mana available, right? Can you play your land drop? And then, so, you know, that's the thing I would think about. I might not have very many fours and fives and I might go be a few more sixes. Don't go crazy. I'm not yeah, saying do like, not go crazy. I'm not like saying I'll have no fours and no fives and uh, 20 sixes. Purely relying the- on my commander staying alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If people know that, then they're more likely to remove it as well. But I would just lean in those directions a little bit more yeah. considering my curve. Yeah. yeah, your commander has a lot to do with your play pattern. Um, and then the last thing I would think about, because we've been under the assumption and talking about commanders that, you know, for the most part, you play, you want to play them as soon as you possibly can in a game. Yeah, that we sort of actually had, that's sort of been the norm and what we've typically talked about, but that isn't necessarily the case. Yeah, there are kind of two different classes of commander, I would say. There are setup commanders and payoff commanders. And the setup ones are the ones you want to get out as soon as you can, because they are setting up for future plays. Yeah, they're an engine in a way. So a Layla is like this, right? Like yep. everything you play after you play a Layla is better. So you want to get a Layla out as soon as possible to make all the cards in your hand better. You don't want to mm-hmm. play all the cards in your hand, then play a Layla, because a Layla doesn't do anything if you're not following it up with those non-creature spells. Right. Uh, Yarok is similar, right? You want ETB effects on creatures, but if you played all those cards first and then played Yarok, that's not a good sequencing. Yeah. Yeah, you want to go Yarok as fast as possible. You might even hold cards you could play in your hand until Yarok's out, right? I've definitely done that, and especially if people don't know the power level of your deck, they're less likely to get rid of something, especially... And another thing to consider is what do other people's commanders look yes. like and are they remove on site because i know if i'm gonna play my commander and someone else is gonna drop theirs that mine's way lower in the totem pole then I'm, I'm much happier putting it out early yeah for sure if they've got a satoru and i've got a yark then i know that yeah you know if they've if they played satoru and it got killed already well that's one less removal spell yeah that the table has yeah, yeah. now the it, payoffs there was an interesting um jake 
boss who works here is a director on game nights and our post-production soup. He recently, I think talked about on the show, but also built an Omnath mutate deck. Oh, and the whole idea. I see. Yeah. It's the new Omnath. The one where like on your second land drop, you get yeah, me on your third, third land, land drop. drop four damage. To everyone. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. His strategy is he's mutates the Omnath. So that it's <laughs> not legendary anymore. And then clones it. Ah, so you get multiple triggers. So yeah, he's like, play my third land, do 12 to everybody or whatever. Cause I got three clones of a mutated Omnath. Right. But I was talking to him. I was like, how's this playing? He's like, well, it's hard because I end up playing out all my lands before my main plan is uh, online, right? Because I need to mutate. A I need deck. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so where you'd normally want to like hold your fetch lands and things and then play them once he's already out, he has a whole nother step of mutating and then cloning it. And that's a lot of lands that get played so he doesn't have as many in his hands. So that's, yeah, right. exactly. So Omnath is setup commander, obviously. Payoff commanders are the ones that you play after you've done other stuff. So it's the reverse of the Yarks of the world. Yeah, Atraxa is the most obvious in the Super Friends deck or you already have tons of counters out. Then comes Atraxa and then she buffs everyone up by proliferating. So Yeah, because Atraxa is no good if you don't already have counters on stuff, right? Like, yeah, you do I mean, unless you care about gaining four Vigilance Flying Lifelink the next turn. And Death Touch, right? Is it, it's not Vigilance. Yeah, I think it's just Flying Death Touch Lifelink. It's pretty good blocker. I suppose, but yeah, yeah, it's not doing anything unless your strategy's already going. I think Corvold's kind of similar, right? You have yes. to be able to sacrifice things. So you see a lot of Corvold decks where Corvold does not come out as soon as possible. They're setting up other things, treasures, treasures fetch lands, play. all that. Yeah. yeah, getting that all set up, and then they go Corvold, blah 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 blah, draw fifteen million cards. Probably do that like twenty times while you sit there and look at your phone, but. <laughs> <laughs> or look at Corvald being like, wow, impressive. Look at the sequencing. Yeah, but they because, knew it was a payoff commander. Yeah, because Corvald is a payoff for sacrificing things, you just need to set up the dominoes first yep. before the commander comes out. So yeah. the commander is a huge piece of your curve consideration, obviously, but it is not the only piece. We're going to talk about more to do with mana curve, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. Hey Josh, my sports state you got there? Shame if someone cast Wrath of God. Ooh, Boros Charm, indestructible. Ooh, uh, I got this Hex. Veil of Summer, Hex Proof. <gasps> well, Cyclonic Rift. Wow. It's Fairy's Protection, uh, everything's gone. Uh, Bye. How do you always have an answer? Oh, well, I wouldn't be caught dead without insurance. That's why I use Policy Genius to shop for life insurance. Life insurance isn't just for when you're older. If you have anyone relying on you, like a child, aging parent, or partner, Partner, you ought to have it. Luckily, Policy Genius makes it easy to shop for and buy life insurance all in one place. To get started, just click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com slash command. Answer some simple questions and they'll hook you up with quotes from top companies so you can find your lowest rate. You can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. And once you've chosen a quote, Policy Genius's team of experts will help you apply for the policy and understand your options. They work for you, not the insurance companies. So you can trust them to offer unbiased advice. Head to policygenius.com slash command to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Hi, Borinclex Voice of Hunger here, and I speak for all the hungry people and praters out there when I say we want to eat and we want to eat now. That's why we need Factor, the meal service where you never have to wait to sate your world-consuming cravings. It's a new year. You're working on the grind, tapping down lands. You don't have time to cook or shop. But Factor's pre-completed meals are delivered ready to eat in just two minutes. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh, never frozen, prepared meals that are so delicious you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. And whether you want vegan options, extra protein, or literally all the food like me, Factor's got you covered. With over 27 options each week, even a ravenous devourer of planes won't get bored. That said, I could eat their chive and garlic chicken forever! So remember folks, listen to the voice of your hunger when it says, try Factor today. Head to go.factor75.com slash command120 and use code command120 for $120 off. That's code command120 at go.factor75.com slash command120 for $120 off. When the command zone first began, it was just Jimmy and me. But since then, we've grown into a team of talented editors, skilled VFX artists, and writers so masterful, I consider them my personal heroes. Really, guys? Hiring is not easy though. If you want to find the best people, you need the best tools. That's why we use Indeed, the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Browsing tons of different job sites just takes too long, but Indeed can do it all. Plus, it's the only job site where you don't pay anything unless you find candidates that meet your requirements. That is time and money you could spend getting gifts for your beautiful writers. 
All right, come on, guys. And Indeed saves you more time with talent-finding tools like virtual interviews and instant match, which gives you a short list of candidates the moment you sponsor a post. Then you can invite them to apply right away, like when, I don't know, you need to hire a new writing team ASAP. Mm -hmm. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Command Zone. This offer is valid through March 31st, so go to Indeed.com slash Command Zone to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Again, Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome back, everybody. We are talking about mastering your mana curve as well as your gameplay because your mana curve is important. It's like eating good nutritional food every day. You're going to need it for it's a like well-balanced... Yeah, it's like eating your veggies. You need to do it, and turns out you can actually make your veggies taste very, very good. I like veggies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Broccoli. Bro oh, I love broccoli. Yeah. Broccoli is like a two drop. Yeah, I usually cover like ra with ranch or butter though, so that probably <laughs> negates the health. That's of yeah, that's yeah. like commander tax. It's like yeah, I have to. Pay. I'm trying to pay cast my commander, but it costs twenty mana now. I'm just gonna put some more butter on it. I point. remember saying to my mom once, like, I like salad. She's like, you don't like salad. You like salad dressing. <laughs> She ain't wrong. Got me. Got yeah, me. got you. Uh, um, but here was why veggies are important is because they are a core part of your diet. The opposite, like the butteries and the butteries and the very high dense foods that aren't as good for you. Well, they're kind of like high mana value spells. Yeah, I think I like this comparison. And I think there's probably a lot of people out there because we get yelled at every time that we're like saying, hey, we're playing more two mana rocks and things like that. Yeah. It's just like that's what the game's giving us. And that's what the game is incentivizing us to do because it is just more fun to do more things. Yeah. And so that is, you know, the way we're playing, even though we're purposely not pushing ourselves all the way into CDH. It's not like we don't know it exists up there and we couldn't like figure out what what those decks are because we could we could google it just like other players yeah do. we could type furiously into our computers as well yeah and, and i have a cdh <laughs> deck and i like to play it once in a while but for the most part we don't play at that level because we just kind of keep ourselves right where we want to be yeah but that doesn't mean the mana curve still does better and that we don't want to play some high mana spells right we still like the big splashy stuff we like to play it on game nights usually those are the cards that get a cool animation and a big wow from the table so that's always fun yeah and they make you feel awesome it's when you know i loved insurrection when i first started playing oh, yeah. the game because it made you feel awesome yeah it's, i take everything oh wow Oh, and then I found out that there are a lot of downfalls to having too many high mana value spells. Yeah, so we're not saying don't play any, but we want people who don't understand the pitfalls or why they are dangerous yeah. to know, like, here's here's the problem with high mana value spells and why you just don't want too many of them, why you want to lower your curve in general. Yeah, you can't have dessert for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right, that's true. You can't eat cotton well, candy you for can. every meal, you even though my, ne my niece definitely wants to do that. <laughs> you can, you'll just feel the impact of it very quickly, as you will with high mana value spells. So here are I why. I ultimately it would be bad for you in the long term, too. Cotton candy for every meal? In the long term? What about the short term <laughs> you would hate yourself after a day it's you're true. like oh man that was a bad idea it's like uh when ron uh, what's Not even in the it's like drinking milk on a hot day it's like oh i don't know um so yeah so we obviously we still love playing big splashy spells it's oftentimes still my favorite way to win the game or a combination of a couple big spells uh but having too many in your deck we've touched on this a little bit but here's sort of why it can be bad for your diet and especially your curve yeah so they're gonna cause you to have to mulligan more Yes. Because they will rot in your hand otherwise. So it And this is like five, six drops too. We're not even talking eight, nine drops at this point. Yeah. So if you look at your first seven, if there's multiple cards that are six or more mana, it, you almost don't even think of those as cards in your hand. You're looking at the other five. Let's say three of those are lands. You have two cards in your hand, basically? Yeah. And what if they don't ramp you or get more card draw or get you to be able to play those cards? Then those six mana value cards and up are basically not there. Yeah. So, they might come into play later in the game, but you can't even guarantee it yeah yeah that's a good point yeah so they rot in your hand they make you they give you less options because a lot of times you're just like if these were any cards that could reasonably go in my deck and cost four mana yeah then i could this hand looks way better right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um all right they can also lead to horrendous tempo blowouts yeah this is probably what i've suffered from the most which is and the blue player is just just frothing at the mouth when this happens. I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right, I'm going to tap out, and I'm going to cast this huge thing I've been waiting the whole game to do. I haven't done anything else the whole game. You get countered. You get mana drained. You get something or another. Swords of Plowshares. You get removed in response. Yeah. Uh, your Eldrazi conscription looks real bad at that point. I think not enough players understand tempo enough to pinpoint that as the reason they lost but there are many many games that are lost and we've talked about the fact that like the amount of mana um spent will mm -hmm. often be an indicator of who's 
you know, more likely to win that game. Well, a way to kind of reverse those numbers is Jimmy spends 10 mana on something and I spend one mana to waste it. Yeah, to get rid of it. He's basically down nine mana in that exchange. And so if he spent 30 and I only spent 20, I might be ahead now. Right. Because we, or at least even because of that one play. And whereas if he plays a four drop and then another four drop, and a two drop. Well, my Swords of Plowshares gets rid of one of them, but the worst I'm up on him is three mana. Yeah. And not that, just that, what if I play an enchantment, an artifact, and a creature instead of just one big creature? Their Swords of Plowshares looks even worse. I played a game just the other night and I played Mana Confluence. And originally I was holding it in my hand because I thought maybe I'll counter something and draw mm. uh, three, two cards. Um, and it got to the end step before my turn and nothing really impactful had been played that I needed to counter. And I was going to, in my mind, I was like, maybe I'll cast it and draw the three cards, right? That's Wait, Mana awesome. Confluence or? Uh, Mystic Confluence. Mystic Confluence. Okay. Mystic Confluence. Yeah, mana yeah. Confluence is a land. The land, yeah, Mystic yeah. Confluence. Right. Five mana spell, tons of modes on it. Yeah. So, and I realized this person has a five drop, this person has a six drop, and then my other player has a five drop. And I was like, for five mana, I'm going to negate 16 mana from my opponent. Ooh, you could bounce three things, right? Yeah. So wow. I could bounce, bounce, bounce. And I won that game. And I think that moment was the reason I won that game. But it would be very hard for an outside observer at the end of the game to have Pinpoint. pin- pinpointed that moment as the moment I won the game. But I right. basically used my uh, Mystic Confluence as an extra turn spell almost mm. in that instance. Because they all had to now redeploy their most expensive thing. Do just either redo what they already did or do something about the same yeah on their next turn and i got to just develop my board further and yeah it i just felt like from that moment on i was ahead in the game where i was about even right before it right that man confluence looks way worse against an elf ball deck someone that just dumps six elves and they're all doing something that's powerful right yeah imagine my opponent's stuff was mostly three and two mana stuff mm-hmm. eh, i'm probably just drawing the cards like it it just doesn't feel as good to be like five mana to get six mana of my opponent's stuff or seven mana of yeah my that's stuff. a huge tempo blowout for sure yeah so the more you sort of extend yourself on the high mana plays and stick your neck out there the more it hurts when it gets chopped off so that is again we're not saying don't play the big splashy stuff but you have to consider like if this goes wrong how bad is this for me and if it means like i just wasted my entire turn i that person who swords to plowshares your blightsteel classes when you hard cast it they just cast time stretch on you, kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be very hard for you, especially if you're using like treasures or whatever to pop it out early for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a real feel bad. Um, and then the last thing is that you know when you do cast those big mana spells, they do in the same way that Josh was waiting to use mana conflict or mana mystic conflict at the right time. They draw a lot of attention towards yourself. And if you are in the position where you're drawing attention towards yourself, but you're not being proactive and also stopping other people from attacking you or removing it or doing all that, then you're just needlessly kind of like throwing away free value. It's like you're going to a place that you know you're going to get pickpocketed and you're wearing fancy jewelry. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point because often... A four drop and a three drop, whatever they are, will just seem less scary than the seven drop that some that Craig just played. Yeah, right. And that'll naturally cause your opponents to look at the person who played the seven drop. You know, it's Elishnorn or something like that. If somebody plays Elishnorn, they almost always immediately become the arch enemy. The whole table is like, hey, we got to yeah. do something. Yeah, about yeah, this, yeah. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you played like you know Vidalcan Orrery into you know some three drop something else, yeah, you know, rarely do people go like, well, we got to kill that person right away. Well, it's it, interesting. Even even if you look at the last game nights, two of the things that caused the biggest whoa and then either got instantly removed or just drew unnecessary attention was you playing Mind Silation. Mm-hmm. Didn't actually do that much for you that game, nope. but everyone went, that card is powerful. This and even in the interviews, I remember being like, this is going to turn the game around, even though the game had already finished and it you know didn't actually have that effect, but it drew way more attention than it brought to you. And then Zach played. Uh, uh, the Great Henge, yep. and that just got blasted out of nowhere because he cast it for cheaper as well, but it's just such a powerful high CMC spell that everyone goes, no, 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 can't have that anymore. Yeah, so you have to think of the social impact of the cards that you're playing, and a big splashy card will often just draw more attention and make you more the arch enemy. So that is definitely yeah. a downside, whereas multiple small things are de- are, are usually not as scary to your opponents. Yeah, Great Henge, though, amazing card because he instantly got value off of yeah. it. Yeah, uh, still was good for him. A little better than that Mind's that Violation. That deck was really impressive. It just kept bouncing back. Yeah, I felt like crazy. we were like, gotta get it under control. Okay, good. And he was like, blah, 50 Gotta things, get yeah. it under control. Oh, crap. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, so now let's, uh, on the reverse side, talk about the advantage of low drops, why low drops are good. Um, and, and having low mana cards is not just about being able to play stuff early. 
It's also about versatility. Yeah, versatility is huge. And this is something people, I think, forget, which is like we plan our decks in such a way so that plays out in turn one, two, three, four. But turn six, seven, eight, nine are when you have way more lands, way more cards potentially in your hand, and way more options and more things to actually do with the mana. And in the beginning games, you're not using removal spells because there's just not that much out there. But later on, you may need to start pairing cards together to have maximum effect. Yeah, I think people think of like, oh, but later in the game when I have this amount of mana, I'll want to want to cast this thing. But if it's seven mana, it generally means I'm doing that and nothing else. Yeah. And so the fact that like, if you build your deck and it has a lot of, you know, twos, threes, and fours, you can go, I'm going to destroy that scary thing and advance my board. Because you know how we talked earlier about in general, you know, magic as a game is designed such that the stuff that costs less mana is less powerful than the stuff that costs more mana, right? So like, there's not very many two drop spells that are as powerful as even the worst six drop spell. Yeah, yeah. You know, it does happen because they've made mistakes over the years, (laughs) but there's not a lot of that running around. However, two three mana spells might be roughly equal to the power of a six drop spell or even more powerful in some instances. Yeah, especially if they coordinate or co- or uh, work with your commander or with each other. Yeah. So you can kind of see that like having a lot of three drops doesn't actually disadvantage you against a deck that has a lot of six drops, even once you get up to the point where they can cast the six drops easily. Yeah. Because you're like, well, f- fine, whatever. I'll just play two things. Uh, I'll dual s- double spell, as they call it in, in some other formats. Double spell. Yep. Yeah, um, multiple actions, too. And, and not just that, sometimes it's important, and we talk about this with board wipes, why a six CMC board wipe is sometimes not that great is because if that's the only thing you're doing, everyone else gets a chance to rebuild their board before you. So I see myself playing more Damnation uh, yep. and more Wrath of God. Um, and even in that last game, Winds of Abandon, another great example. I was like, yep. well, it's really good, six mana, but it's the only thing I'm doing and it actually benefits other players. And then they have a whole turn to use the extra mana they get against me. Yeah, it makes it tough. So this is really something to consider about mana curve. It's like, yes, Decree of Pain is so much more powerful than a lot of other board wipes, but you probably still want to run the cheapest ones you can because you really, it, when you find yourself board wiping, a lot of times you're like, wow, I wish I could board wipe and then place one or two things. Yeah, to get my engine going at least. So at least I'm the first one getting back on the board. Yeah. The green paint may not be the best example because Mono Black has a, no problem getting up to huge amounts of mana. But in those cases, even then it's like, well, would you rather spend all that mana on just one card or three cards, four cards? Right. Um, and then thinking about play patterns again, let's say you have a lot of two mana rocks in your deck. Mm-hmm. Think about that how that might affect your play pattern. So on turn three, if you played a two mana rock on turn two, you're going to have access to four mana. Right, one rock, three lands. Yeah, so what if you have already a lot of two mana rocks in your deck, there's going to be many games where you have two in your opening hand, Mm -hmm. which means now on my turn three, where I have four mana, I tap two and play a rock. Ah. And there's a couple different ways to go from there. Either play a three drop now. So Mm -hmm. now my turn four, three is looking insane because i played five mana worth of stuff or some you we've all had these games where you go turn two rock turn three (laughs) two more rocks plus a two drop those those are the games where you're just like i have seven things on the board is turn three yeah and no one's ready to pop off their board wipe quite yet because if you're the only but you're able to develop get card advantage do whatever it is you're already down the track it's like the rabbit and the uh the tortoise except in this case you're not taking any naps yeah, so I think two drops and two mana rocks kind of lead us in this path to playing more two drops in general. Yeah. And just so we can have those explosive play patterns when they happen upon us. Yeah, again, think of it like the allowance. When you play those rocks, it's like you just got an extra dollar added. And every time you can spend that dollar to do something, it's going to result in more candy, more toys, more whatever it is. And your opponents are not going to have that as much. So that just instantly puts you out and hopefully allows you to get into a position where you can then start refilling your hand and doing the other parts of your deck. And at that point, your engine is built, but it's not built on like specific interactions because a mana rock's a mana rock. Yep. It's it's not like they got rid of your one enchantment and now everything doesn't work anymore. Were you one of those kids that invested their allowance? No. I spent it all every time. <laughs> I had a friend, because I was like you. I was like buying magic cards or whatever. Magic but I had cards, a friend candy, who like, yeah. had a jar, and I don't know, his parents must have talked him into it or whatever, but he did it. He didn't <laughs> he didn't fight it. And he like would take, you know, I think he you know, if he got ten dollars, he'd take two dollars and put it in that jar oh, every nice. time, you know. And I remember when he went to college, he had like a few thousand dollars. Okay, that's pretty I did nice. I didn't have that when I went to no, college. Oh man, that's a whole new computer at that point. <laughs> exactly. That's so much you can do with that money. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how it works in magic. You cannot use the mana you don't spend in the game later on in your next game. You gotta use it in the game you're in. By the way, he should have like actually invested it. That, that, I guess <laughs> that's like invested. that was just saving. That, his parents did him a disservice by just letting him put it into a jar where inflation's gonna beat the amount of yeah, yeah, exactly. like losing Roth money. IRA, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, you can't take that out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like 63, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
So, I, yeah, it was kind of similar, I guess, to we did a little aside about, like, if I played more three-mana rocks, I would play more two-drops yeah. so that I could, you know, think about those play patterns. But the adv- the advantage of low-drops and just thinking about the ability to every time, oh, I play this four-drop, it's going to leave me with one mana left over. I have yeah, one drop. I can do deck. something with it. I yeah. can fit fit that in. I think activated abilities and things like that. Oh, on yeah, that's a really good point. Is something you can think of in the same respect. So if you know you have a certain amount of activated abilities in your deck, you yeah. can think of like, oh, good. So now when I have one or two extra mana, I have places to put that mana and still get value out of it. Yeah, Shorakai, again, the great example of yeah. that. It's on your commander, but lots of decks t- cost one to tap this thing and do something. And if it starts synergizing with the rest of your deck, good job. All right, let's just, I guess let's move into talking about the right low drops to play because I don't want people to get the idea that we're like, hey, you should play bad two drops over good four drops. Ah, no, no, no. Or only play low drops instead of, yeah, higher drops as well. You need to play the right ones. Yeah. Or good, yeah, just, yeah, good ones. But I think you could give something a, a sort of a, a bonus points in your head that it's it's cost less CMC, so it doesn't have to meet the same bar that a four yeah. drop would meet. But you still want to play good cards, you know, in general over bad cards you don't want to just play vanilla two twos or something like that because there's just not good enough to play in commander yeah and there's so many cards now that in every single mana value slot you're going to find the cards that fit into pretty much every category card draw creature removal ramp whatever it is or synergizing synergizing with your deck so how do we identify which low mana value cards are going to be good for the the whole game rather you know not just drastically lower the power level of my deck because if i don't draw them on turn two or have them in my opening hand they're not as good yeah so we wanted to talk about something that's called scaling or we're calling scaling which is cards that scale well as the game goes on so a card that's good on turn two but still useful yeah later in the game if you happen to draw it or have it later doesn't mean it has to be as good, good later it just needs to do something that will still be relevant because if it's just a 2-2 yeah. two, two, right you just play a 2-2 two, two. that's not bad on turn two because people won't probably have creatures they'll probably get in there for some damage but as the game continues people will start playing their three four five drop creatures they're gonna be much bigger than two mm-hmm. twos that two two doesn't do anything else it can't attack now it maybe could block one attack but in general it hasn't scaled well because it's just not a factor in the game later yeah and notably we're also not telling you to take out cards like rampant growth just because it's really bad on turn seven or eight some cards are so good if you're able to play them on curve that you still keep them in there even though they don't scale as well but there are many many cards that scale very well where you're okay playing it on turn one and maybe you're even happier playing it on turn six or seven so there's a card endless one and it's a simple card but we just want to use it as an example x mana x mana and it is an xx creature yep so this is a card that scales into the game because on turn one you have one mana you want to play it it's a one one not very good probably don't do that yeah but if you had to you could yep two on turn two it's a two two but if you when you draw it on turn eight or nine and you have 12 mana available i mean Again, it's not a great play to do, but it is more powerful than in when you play it on turn two. Yeah. So it has scaled with the game in some way. It's You could also play it for five and then a four drop, right? So it can also uh, really fit good perfectly point. with the other cards in your hand. Now, generally, this card needs more synergy to be playable in Commander, but it, we just wanted to use it as a, you know, demonstrating what scaling is. Walking Ballista or Hanging Back Walker might be a little bit better example. A little bit better, yeah. yeah. They're very good examples. And yeah. even in some corner cases, you play it for zero just to get something into your graveyard. And obviously, Ballista has a bunch of combo potential and things like that. But just yeah. as cards that scale, those are quite good. You know the card that I've been playing more and more, Jimmy, is Shigeki, uh, Jukai Visionary. Oh, is this the one that reduces some cost? No, this is the one. It's a 1-3 um, for two mana. You can tap two and then bounce it to your hand and look at your the top four cards of your library. And if there's a land put into play... That reminds me of Thrasios. <laughs> yeah, so but it bounces itself to your hand, so you can only do that once. Right. But then it has the channel ability. Oh, it's like right. green, green, it. XX. You discard it, and then you return X non-legendary creatures from your graveyard to your hand. Right. And so I've been using Shigeki as a really versatile two-drop that I play on two if I don't have any other ramp going on. Right. It'll ramp me on turn three if I need to do that, if I don't have anything else going on. It's a good fit in, too, with, like, I play a rock, I have two mana left over, I Shigeki, I get a land into play. And then once it's in my hand, or if I draw it later, I use it to regrow stuff from my graveyard and get 
better cards back because I, at that point in the game later I don't need the ramp and I don't need the two drop right that's actually great it's modal uh, yeah. in a lot of ways and typically we like modal spells because giving you more options gives you that flexibility and it scales better as well yeah and you're looking at modes that are different enough that like one mode is good early in the game and one mode's mm-hmm. better later I will say that Shigeki also because we're playing Balagad recovery and like all green decks right yep so now I can get my Balagad recovery as one I'll of the cards Shigeki I get back, back. with Shigeki ah. and then you know get three or four other cards and then get Shigeki back with my Balagate Recovery, and then I, I'm into that loop that you're doing with the Sky Turtle in uh, yeah. Neon Dynasty Limited, um, but with Balagate Recovery and Shigeki. So it, it, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it gives you inevitability in the late game if you're kind of if you don't have anything else going on. Yeah, that reminds me of one of my new favorite black cards, which is Douthy Voidwalker. Oh, yeah. Everyone's favorite. Uh, Because it has the ability early to just come down and start hosing graveyards, but later on in the game, it's not like things are not going to be entering the graveyard. And its ability is so powerful that you will want to be able to use it because people are going to be putting amazing cards in the graveyard at every part of the game in Commander. And typically, actually, more powerful later on. Yeah, for sure. It's a two drop. So if you get it out early, it's stopping graveyards from ever getting off the ground. Yeah. And if you play it later and a graveyard deck has already got enough stuff in its graveyard, you can still nab a spell with it if you had to. Well, yeah. I mean, at that point, too, it's like a, like if you're trying to remove stuff, right? Because yeah. it has to have stuff get sent to the graveyard. But it just starts catching things. It's yep. always catching. And sure, you may want it to catch from the beginning of the game on, but you're okay if it comes down turn six and catches stuff from turn that turn onwards as well. Yeah, it's never not doing its thing. So it's always going to be good at, yeah. at the thing it's doing. Also, I've gotten hit with that thing a few times and I uh, actually died to it once because of the shadow. I'm yeah. like, wait, what? But I'm only at three. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, shadow. Uh, that mechanic is very funny to me. Uh, Bale for Strix is another good uh, oh, yeah. uh, scaling card. And a lot of cards that cantrip are going to be good uh, are going to scale well. So it's a flyer with death touch. It's a good blocker. It's a one, one that costs blue and the black. Yep. So especially if you play against people like Craig, people, aggro players, mm. getting a blocker down early will often thwart the first attack. And then they're kind of incentivized to just attack whoever they attack the first time until that person's dead. Yeah. And then if you draw it late, it cycles itself, it, or sorry, it cantrips itself, right? It's yep. still a blocker, but maybe that blocker doesn't matter as much. But you're like, I wish this was any other card. Well, for two mana, it can be, right? You just yeah. play it. <laughs> well, not just that. People will have flying crazy threats at that mm-hmm. point. And a 1-1 one, one Death Touch Flyer, is, it's like when we were playing Hornet Queen. Right. It just turns out those little wasps are incredibly annoying, and you can't get past them because you don't want to lose. It's like the same thing. You're trading a 2-mana 1-1 one, one Death Touch Flyer for their 7-mana Flyer. Or whatever. Right. You're getting a huge mana advantage there, and it's a temple loss. Growth Spot. Spiral is another card I know it sees quite a bit as play that I would fit in a similar category. I love this card. You, yeah. I'm very happy playing it later on in the game. Yeah, I, I think when I first saw it, I thought like, oh, later in the game, I don't have lands in my hand, so then I'm just two mana draw a card. But yeah. it's like, well, later in the game, when you don't have lands in your hand, you probably have a lot of mana on the table. It's fine because it's still better often than a rampant growth because in a rampant growth can only find me a land where both piles like boom replace itself maybe draw a really good card off the top of your deck at least yep. get to the next card mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah 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 card draw is great uh faithless looting and knight's whisper or knight's whisper yeah I-, I thought it was knights with a k but it's not <laughs> um, game knight's whisper yeah I'm to only one my stand are also really good cards and i know a lot of people play these cards but a lot of people don't because they don't fit in with a synergy but because they're low cmc sign in blood same yep. thing they give you something to do and think about those those turns where you go two mana rock third turn two mana rock two mana rock knight's whisper yeah you just feel on top of the world and unbeatable there you i got filled up your hand yeah so i got much. seven mana and i just re- refilled my hand like yeah, yeah. Faithless Looting too. you can play it again from the graveyard. I've had so many games where you just start petering out towards the end. You got card draw, but you've only drawn lands. A card like Faithless Looting is just so good in that spot because you can cast it twice for four mana total, and then you can look through four cards in your library. So it's very, very good. And on the front end, it's only one mana, and it's so often just like, I have one extra mana. I wish I could spend it. Oh, look, now I can just upgrade yeah. this and you know something else in my hand that I don't want right now. Yeah, have more faith in Faithless Looting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have faith in gotta have pink thigh. oh we should have sang that song um, wouldn't have made any sense yeah because <laughs> the one we did made a lot, made of, a lot sense. of sense yeah 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 we, exactly. we jamming yeah 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 uh let's talk about some mechanics that scale because there are just some mechanics that just blanket scale pretty well cycling i think is is one of the clearest ones because yep. it says hey if you draw this card and this card is not good get rid of it yeah, it's, it's especially with a, a low mana card or something like that where this card's not relevant anymore. It's not going to affect the board because yeah. we're late in the game and it's just not a big enough punch to throw. Hey, 
pay the cycling cost, get rid of it. And then it says if you drew the next card in your deck. Yeah, a lot of lands have cycling on them that enter the battlefield tapped. It's always great to sort of like, th- those are to me like the little bits of oil you're squeaking into the, uh, the, the, the tires or the grease that you're adding to it. You just make it hum just a little more smoothly. Yeah, give you that flexibility, give you those options. Because if you drew them in a situation where it's early, then you might play it as a land or play the yeah. sort of low drop side of it. Um, kicker. Very good scale, scaling yeah. a mechanic, yep. yep you just it's, pump it's, more mana in, get more stuff. Yeah, it, it just says like, oh, if this is later in the game, you probably have more mana. And if you have more mana, then you could make this more powerful. Yeah, That's blink of an eye. definition of scaling. Love blinking of, of an eye, right? It's a, it's a really cheap blue removal spell that bounces, but later on, it just cantrips itself as well. And you could do an end step and all that. So it's just more ways. Right now, it's a two mana or a four mana spell. And you can pair that with your hand any number of ways. I think this is why overload spells are so good in Commander. Oh, because yeah. again... Um, they are just like Vandal Blast. I've used it quite often as a one red destroy one artifact because Mm -hmm. I just have had that laying around and it's like, I want to use all my mana. Maybe this will destroy four things later, but right now there's one bad artifact gone and then I'll just be really efficient. Um, Damn, a lot of people are playing that oh, card. And one that of card, my favorite oh, new cards of so all time. Good. It's a removal spell as well as a board wipe and it's just incredible it's the perfect combination because it's cheap if you want to just destroy one thing and that's often what you want to do Mm -hmm. but it is not that expensive at the board wipe is the wrath of god yeah it's a board wipe when you need that and the problem with board wipes is sometimes you don't want to destroy your own board yeah well in this case it's like yeah you don't want to destroy your own board cool just destroy one thing damn so good yeah uh and then mdfcs Uh, i don't think we're going to see these anytime soon i think they were a little too complicated for r&d or they they cause a little bit too much chaos i hope we don't see them because they're a little too good too yeah they're very good like bob get recovery it's a land but it's also just a regrowth from your graveyard so you get to use it later on in the game if you're choked on lands early you play it down and you maybe your deck has ways of bouncing lands back to your hand as well so you can you can even reuse it in that way later but it's just so good and it's it's almost like a free spell in your deck because instead of a basic land you're almost always okay putting in ball again recovery or valakut awakening or any of these sort of the pay three life spells as well and think about how much this affects your curve because, you know, that, that Valigate Recovery, Valakut Awakening, things like that, they're zero drops or three drops, right? Right. So they, and the three drop part is very useful even later in the game, right? The Valigate Recovery, actually not that useful as a sorcery early, but if you need the land, it's there for you. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a way to sort of lower your curve, even though on uh, Tapped Out or Moxfield or something, it may look like a three, look like a three drop. Yeah, yeah exactly. So... But that's a, think about, yeah. that's a great thing about scaling. It really helps you re-envision your curve because you might think from the beginning of this episode, it's just like play low stuff, that's it. It's like, no, 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 play, f- be flexible, be open, understand how to make your game work for you. And having scaling mechanics and, and cards is a huge way of making sure that you're having a good time. Yeah, and think through your lines of play and where that's going to leave you and what you'll want in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention, it's just so satisfying <clears throat> when you have five mana and you play a two and a three drop or a uh, one, one, three. It's yeah. just like, ah, oh, nice, perfect. I found, uh, yeah, it's like Tetris, like you said. Yeah. I found the perfect ding, fit. Ding, ding, ding. Dong. Come on. <laughs> Did it. Uh, all right. We're, we're going to get close to wrapping up here, but I thought it would be interesting mm-hmm. to kind of look at our mana curve from that five years ago when we first did the episode on the oh, same topic. Okay, yeah. Okay. So it was almost five years exactly. It was May. Yeah. So we're at the end of March. So about a month and a half. Okay. Um, maybe six weeks short of five years ago in 2017. At that time, so we looked at the decks we were playing on game nights then versus the last like five or six decks we played on game nights now. All untapped out, by the way. You can always see the deck list. I know people always ask that are always below the episode. I uh, had Truck, who is an applied stats, uh, he's going for his master's at UCLA right now. So he's a stats guy, help us out with this. We compared the decks um, and we found the following. We are playing about one more, only one more one drop than we were at that time. Okay. So we are definitely like with some rounding trending towards more, more one drops, yeah. but yeah, uh, we're playing six more two drops wow, than we used to play. That's huge. Now keep in mind, right? You have 37 lands in the deck. You have 60 cards. That's 10% more two drops. It's crazy. Cause I mean, we were probably playing somewhere in the realm of like 14, 15, maybe 13 two drops. Yeah. So yeah, it's 50% more two drops than we were playing or yeah, like 40% yeah, yeah. more. So that's the huge change, I think. And, and a pretty big one. And we're playing four more three drops than we used to, which is significant as well. Yep. So you can tell that where would those 
11 cards come from they're coming out of the six seven eights yeah even the four even the fours and fives yeah i think we were playing like like three or four less four drops than we used to so we've we've definitely like been moving towards the lower end of the curve and you know obviously we just looked at our own decks um and only Jimmy and mine because we're the same people that we were. And yeah. Guests come and go and things <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah, there's a lot of variability there. Yeah, and I think we're just responding to the incentive structures that have been put in place by the game design and the cards that have come out. A lot more great two-mana ramp spells mm. and reprints of cards like Three Visits uh, allow you to just be a lot more flexible in terms of adding stuff there. And just great spells at two mana you know then finally a black enchantment removal spell you know yeah. two mana heck you better be putting that in every black deck so i think we've definitely trended towards lowering our curve over time and you know found that to be obviously we're doing it and continuing to do it because it's more fun because we don't incentivize within our play group cedh or super high powered stuff yeah, yeah so we might be way higher on the one drop slot if we are in the cedh category i would expect that to be much much higher yeah and a lot of zero drops probably too we don't play yeah. very many zero drops yeah. uh, at all uh, but we're still trending in that direction because we find it more fun so we think you might you might also find it more fun out there Another interesting thing, and Truck didn't help me with this, but I was looking at the land count mm -hmm. uh, from the last couple of years. Or the same thing from 2017 and from now. And I noticed that you and I are skewing slightly lower on our lands than we used to. So yeah, we're, a little more risks. We're a little closer to... Between 34 and 35 lands yeah. uh, in the last like six months, seven months. Instead of 36, 37-ish. And it, back in 2017, it was more like 36, 37, yeah, yeah, for sure. So that is interesting. I think that is indicative of us lowering our curve and feeling like, you know, we've added two more two-mana rocks too. And I'd say for every couple of two-mana rocks you add, you could take out a land. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that's probably one of the reasons we're lowering our, our, our um, land count a little bit. Yeah, we're also getting slightly better and more efficient card draw so that we're mm -hmm. in less risk of getting to turn four or five and not being able to draw that land. We've gotten our, you know, we did a sign in blood or we did whatever it is. Enough. Just because Will didn't even exist five years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and now we also have more. I mean, I think we're playing more card draw than we were before. And as, as well, just as long when you're moving that average mana curve down, you're not going to need to draw that fifth land as important like as on time necessarily you might still be totally okay and not hurting as bad if you were stuck on four because you could do two two or whatever one three but you can tread water for a minute or like you said you have card draw to kind of get you out of that yeah they yeah, can yeah, pull, yeah you know so. and so many commanders now as well just have card draw tacked onto them which point. allows you to just play slightly less lands yeah exactly because you I guaranteed i'm going to draw some extra cards because it's in my command zone yep anyway just thought that was interesting comparison uh it's crazy to think that was five years ago also yeah, very interesting. I don't know. Do you think it's going to be down to 32, 33 lands in another five years? Or do you think we're sort of reaching sort of the bottom of where it's going to set for a casual? Oh, I think it'll definitely battle. go down and trend in this direction. Because if you think about the way the design works, it's very hard for them to make us go the other direction than we're going. Because every time they create a good two drop, it's probably going to push out a three, four, five, six, seven, eight drop, right? Mm -hmm. It's very rarely going to push out another two drop. Yeah. So we're not... We're just going to consistently lower the curve over time. And as you your curve lowers, you ju yeah, you just don't need as many lands because you can do more with less. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing to hopefully that we don't get is more one mana rocks. One mana rocks, I think, would be a big death knell. I think we're, we're we should be to. done with two mana rocks, too. We've got plenty. Yeah, just reprint plenty. the ones we've got forever. And, you know, like you said, I think it would be nice if they started incentivizing, creating more cards that punished lower CMC stuff. And, and celebrated and, higher CMC commanders. Yeah, and paid off the higher CMC stuff so that there was reason, strategic, tactical reason, like it helps me, yep. you know, in the game to play a little bit higher CMC stuff. Yeah. Stinging study is again, I just think it's the it's exactly what needs to be happening. All right, to the listeners, what is your favorite example of a low drop card or spell that you think scales well into the late game? Yeah. Have you found and also I want to ask, have you found yourself running a few fewer lands, a few fewer, <laughs> less lands these days than you did maybe, you know, four or five years ago if you've been in the format for that long? Be interested to hear people's perspective. Yeah. Oh, I think I have one actually, Hydroid Crisis. Great oh, card. great card. Yeah. Uh, and of course, have you found yourself running fewer lands? Do you find it's for the reasons that we listed above? Or do you have your own reasons? It would be great to hear from everyone. This is definitely one of those topics. I think the more that we talk about it, the more we can sort of, again, demystify the idea. We're not telling people to play efficiently or get good, bro. We're trying to open up the format to be more fun to people. And it just so happens that playing cards efficiently, this was true five years ago, by the way. Yep. Had we known these lessons that back then, I think we would have trained it downward even a little faster. And I think there was less options to be efficient. Now it's a little bit easier 
easier to be. Yeah. It's like you kind of trip and fall and you, you land on a bunch of two drops that are playable in commander. <laughs> you know, there was, you had to search a little bit harder back then. Yeah. Blink and you'll just be surrounded by two drops. Surrounded by mana rocks. Right yeah. Ah. <laughs> All right. If you want to get your hands on any two drops, mana rocks, any low curve stuff, go to channelfireball.com slash command. They have their great big marketplace with a ton of vendors there. They've got a big inventory. They've got every card under the sun. If you are looking for something to, you know, optimize your deck or help with the efficiency or whatever you're trying to do. Or go in the opposite direction. Hey, you got that option too. Yep. You can always uh, add more high CMC stuff if you think that's fun. We do get... Uh, a lot of people asking, being like, hey, my decks are a little too powerful for my ah, play group yes. and they don't like it. That's a way to go. But in any case, you're a magic player. You're going to need magic cards to do those things. Channelfireball.com slash command is the place to go to do that. And when you get those cards, put them into ultra pro sleeves. Protect them with the highest quality product on the market. Not just that, but the product that's been trusted by us and players around the world for 20 plus years now. This company knows what they're doing. They have very solidly been making the best stuff for a long time. And they have the official magic license so that all of the art you're seeing is the real stuff. The stuff that you can get on the cards to match. You can get such, we have these wall scrolls that hang around the office. And I just love looking at them because it brings me into the world in the same way that i bought anime wall scrolls when i was a kid but now they're magic the gathering wall scrolls and i feel like a real adult wait was it anime wall scrolls when you were a kid or posters oh wall scrolls wall oh, scrolls wow. were all the, the hype back then i because I, when i was a kid it was posters yeah and man wall scrolls are so much better they just classier so, right yeah way classier they're not all wrinkled they and you don't can fold it up when you're done yeah, yeah they don't like you can't like touch it once in it like posters i feel like i have to frame but wall yeah, scrolls if you walk by it and catch it on like your sleeve it <laughs> rips over. like yeah. yeah but the wall scroll is beautiful and it just stays like looking classy yeah and i think the art looks great on it too we're looking at olivia crimson bride yep. next to us and we have uh the wandering, the wandering emperor over it yeah and it yeah. just looks amazing so ultra pro is the company that makes all of that they have their online store but you can also go to your local game store and just buy ultra pro product and they're helping out your game store and supporting us at the same time all right to the end step i want to cheat a little with the end step here jimmy oh, okay because we have been going through something pretty major that we should talk about and it is magic related and so it's, it's related to our channel but it's our patreon oh yes there's a big big change yeah, so we just did a big revamp of our Patreon. And of course, if you watched this episode to this point, you probably heard about the Game Nights auditions that mm -hmm. are happening, um, which is a great reason to join our Patreon right now because a patron at any tier can audition to be on Game Nights. That's for a limited time. And you can uh, sign up just to audition, by the way. There's no harm in that. Yeah, it's totally fine to sign up for the Patreon just because you want to audition for Game Nights. In fact, uh, we encourage it. One of the reasons we sort of make sure you have to be a patron in order to audition is just to keep the numbers reasonable. Yeah, how many it, entries were there last? Last time, last time there was like 5,000. Uh, no, last time it was like a little under 2,000, I think. Oh, okay. But if we got 10,000 auditions, it would take so much time to go through them yeah. that it just becomes like not something we can do. So we're just trying to limit it to a few thousands of, you know, auditions because just the amount of time it takes and multiple people go through it so we can narrow it down. We don't want it to just be like one person making the call. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so if you're joining our Patreon right now, there's some things you should know because we just switched over and revamped the whole thing. We've made it a lot better. Uh, one of the Way things... Way better. Yeah. Jimmy, when we originally set up our Patreon, it was 2016. Mm -hmm. And we didn't... Patreon was pretty new. Yeah, it was almost like an afterthought in the same way that we set up our YouTube and it was kind of like an afterthought. We were like, yeah, I guess we should put these videos on YouTube. And over time, we realized this is an amazing platform. This is a great way for us to connect with our community and get our message out there. So we started to add a little bit over time, but we didn't pay as much attention to it as, as I think it deserved, especially because this is like the backbone for our content for game nights for extra turns it's because of the patreon that we're and, and like stuff like kickstarter crowdfunding right that we were able to garner the support of our community and make a ton more content for the people that are watching it yeah and and i think free content know, by the way we, we've been in a lucky position where the patreon was pretty successful pretty early and i think it, you know, we were able to not pay a ton of attention to it and still have it be very important to our mm -hmm. organization, providing a lot of, you know, revenue that allowed us to advance in the ways that I think you've all seen. Yep. You know, one of the things we're super proud of is that, you know, a lot, most of the revenue that comes in, it's it's going back into our content and into our channel. Yeah, it's almost a direct funnel. Yeah. It's not like Josh and I are running around buying stuff. <laughs> we're literally bringing on new people and hiring new people and, bring, and upgrading every single thing that we can so that we can make a better final product. Yeah, that's what's important and fun to us and so yeah all the revenue that we're, we've got coming in you know most of it's just going right back into buying equipment and doing cooler stuff and I think you see that when you watch the content hopefully yeah. game nights compared to you know 2016 to now is insanely different it's, even our podcast yeah you know all and, and like so many different things you know in terms of the giveaways we're getting more efficient and better at all these things so 
you know, I think we were kind of like afforded a little bit of uh, leeway mm. with the Patreon in that we didn't have to think about it too much. We kind of initially looked at some other successful patrons, sort of set our tears and our stuff up that way and just kind of left it. Let it roll. It did pretty well. You know, I, I think our patrons have been awesome and the community was a, fairly large. We have an awesome Discord community too as a result. But, you know, we started to look at the Patreon at the end of last year and really realize, you know, we need to give this thing some love. Like these people have been supporting us and we can do so much better than yeah, we've been totally. doing. We can offer more things and, you know, we really wanted to give it a hard look. So we have revamped the entirety of the tier structure we are offering a lot more stuff than we used to offer we have more merchandise yep. we have merchandise bonus. discounts yep we're gonna we've already started releasing bonus content we're gonna start getting that on a schedule so that we can release bonus content more regularly we're gonna start playing spell table games with our patrons uh, jimmy and i are gonna play the command zone staff is gonna play we want to be able to have like weekly spell table matches happening with patrons at certain tiers and we are really looking forward to interacting with our patrons more regularly that's the reason we wanted to start doing the spell table games in the first place mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're just offering like a lot more stuff than we used to. And we also switched to a monthly billing process from what used to be a per video billing process, which was a, it was, to be fair, a, a little bit of a pain in the butt on the back end, but something <laughs> that needed to happen. Yeah, it just simplifies the process for everyone. And it also makes it just so that when you're in at a level, that's the level you're in at. You'll need to set monthly limits. I've sent out you know thousands of messages at this point to make sure everyone knew what was going on. But this makes it simpler. And more importantly, it allows us a better connection to you all, no matter what tier you're at. Yeah, so you can get more stuff, cooler stuff, interact with us more. It's more cut and dry than it was as far as the billing and everything else. We just think it's going to be a much better package. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that is our pitch for the Patreon, but it is something that we're pretty proud of and we're excited about moving forward is we have systems in place now to really, you know, offer all this extra stuff. So I'm excited. Yeah. I hope that it, our community continues to grow and that we get to, you know, get in more games with everybody out there and yeah. really get to know you all a little bit better. Yeah, I think we have one of the best Discord communities in the world. I've been to many different Discord servers and it's just great. Everyone there is helpful. We're, Josh and I are on there every day answering questions and talking to you all as well directly. So that's the way to do it is if you're on our Patreon. Check out all the different tiers. There's lots of different options available. There definitely should be something that fits within your budget. And at the end of the day, you're supporting the content that you love, right? If you think that you've gotten some amount of value from seven years of content now from Josh and myself, then Patreon is the perfect perfect way to help sort of tie the loop, express that, and also fuel more content and get access to more content as well. So you're definitely getting something in return. Yeah, and specifically right now, you get the chance to audition to be on Game Nights, which we know is a really fun experience from mm -hmm. both sides. We've done it three times now. And we've also committed to later this year doing auditions to get on extra ah, turns yes, as right. well. So our patrons are going to have a lot of chances to get involved with our content. Yep. Really, really exciting stuff. Please check it out if you're at all thinking about it. Yeah, um, patreon.com slash command zone should have said that at the top probably <laughs> probably just hopefully there was a graphic that yeah yeah, you know, yeah the whole time and you're already there you're not even listening to the episode anymore or we're in the back tab and you're like wait a minute do i need to close that tab they're just babbling on at this point as long as the lights don't go off on us again oh yeah we're, that's we're good. right <laughs> big thanks to our amazing team here at the command zone made possible by patrons like yourself damon lenz sean Gillis, arthur meadowcroft ashlyn rose lady danger manson lund craig blanchett josh murphy jake boss patrick nan jerm bridging sam walder grav galati truck tie jamie block mitch trafford and evan limberger all right thanks everybody uh for watching thanks to jeffrey palmer for the living card animations that we use on our show and uh, you can find him at living cards mtg and we will see you all next time with a better man curve peace peace thank you for your attention for further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>